Let's all say together, for the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to be reading verse 1 through 14. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 through 14. And in our calisthenics class, would you please stand again? Aren't you glad you can stand, if you can? And I don't know who else is more worthy to be receiving that honor. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, verse 1 through 14. It says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And His disciples came up to show Him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as He sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, or birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. And will betray one another. And will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up. And deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your first coming. You came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Lord, I thank You that You're coming again as the Lion of the tribe of Judah to take away sin in our world. Lord, I thank You today for the presence of the Holy Spirit who is among us. Holy Spirit, have Your way in every heart. Take the Word, the Word of life, the bread of life, and break it and feed it to Your people, Your children today as we come to Your table. Every one of us in our own particular need and situation. And yet corporately as the people of God. I ask today that you would break the bread of life and feed your people. And Father, may we go out stronger than when we came in. May we go out different than when we came in. May we go out transformed from glory to glory into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would teach us how to live in these last days. Prior to your coming, Lord, help us not to be deceived. Lord, help us to be ready. And Father, I pray that you would give me the ability to share your word in a way that would be helpful to your people. I pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Now the disciples were excited about the temple there in Jerusalem. This temple at the time of Christ was known as Herod's temple. He had They'd been working on it for over 40 years. It was regarded as one of the wonders of the world. It was a glorious temple. 
It was God's house. And many people would say, if everything else were, be de were to be destroyed, then surely God would not allow His house to fall. And Jesus reminded them in other places, go back and remember Shiloh. The tabernacle in Shiloh where the ark was taken away because of the sins of the people. God abandoned the tabernacle in Shiloh. I want you to know today that God's not in love with a building. We love our building here. I mean, it's nice to be in here. It's wonderful to have air conditioning and have nice seats to sit in. But this is not the kingdom of God. This is not the kingdom of God. Jesus said to them, Do you see all of these beautiful things that you see? Not one stone is going to be left upon another. And I'm talking about massive stones. I've been to Israel. I've been to Jerusalem. I've been to the Western Wall. And these are huge, massive stones. I'm amazed how they even moved them. I'm amazed. But Jesus said, these things are going to happen. The disciples, now curious, began to say, Lord, tell us, when are these things going to happen? And when, what are the signs of your coming and the end of the age? There's two questions in that. One, when are these stones going to be removed? And when is the end of the age? When you're going to come back? Well, we know that the stones were removed in 70 A.D. Jesus said before He was crucified, He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I leave to your house desolate. And the armies are going to come and they're going to build embankments against you and tear you down. And He wept for the children of Jerusalem and Israel because they had rejected Him. But then He addressed the second question, that is His coming and the end of the age. The end of the age references the end of this age as we know it, as we go into the millennial age, which is the time when Christ returns and He puts underfoot all of His enemies and He rules and reigns upon the earth for a thousand years. The end of this age giving rise to the age to come where the lion will lay down with the lamb. A blessed age where He will rule with a rod of iron. Those who seek to be rebellious because there still will be unconverted people. But He will quickly put down uprisings and rebellions. And His truth and justice and righteousness will prevail. Looking forward to that day. He's coming back. He's coming back. And, but He gave us some signs. And I don't have time to break this down. I've done it on other times, other messages. But I want to bring particular focus to verse 12. It says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The title of the message today is, Don't Let Your Love Grow Cold. Don't let your love grow cold. If there's ever been a time where love has been challenged in the hearts of people in my generation, this is that time. Now I understand all of us could probably look back, if you've been around a long time, you could think back to the Vietnam War, you could think back to World War II, you could think back to massive riots in the past, but I, I'm just speaking of, of where we're at right now. There seems to be a difference though. Now, before there was, at least in our society, an embracing of God's law, at least in admission that we need God people weren't afraid to talk about God people mentioned God people added God to the Pledge of Allegiance one nation under God but somehow in the 60s we got this idea that we don't need God anymore and our courts removed God from our schools First through prayer, then through the Bible. And then it just began to escalate into other areas. 
And now it seems like God is banned, at least in principle. That it's an offense to talk about God in our schools, in our homes. We've become nervous. And as Christians, we become cowards. We've got to a place we're not willing to stand up for the truth when there are many who are standing up for a lie. We're being silenced in the corner. And I'm not talking about getting up and causing riots. We just need to stand up for the truth. You don't have to defend a lion. All you got to do is let him, let him loose. Amen? We don't have to defend the truth. All we got to do is declare the truth. And God will de defend the truth. God's looking for a voice. He's looking for a vessel. Will you be a voice for the truth? Will you be a vessel for the truth? But it says that lawlessness will in abound. Now what is lawlessness? Well, 1 John chapter 3 tells us that sin is lawlessness. Well, sin is a violation of God's law. When we don't keep God's commandments, that is lawlessness. It is acting as if there is no moral law. That there is no moral authority. And we live our lives by our own standards and by our own sense of justice. And as a result, we're accountable to nobody but ourselves. The only thing that restrains Lawlessness in the hearts of men today without the law of God is law and order. I'm going to say that again. If law, lawlessness is in the heart of man, the only thing that restrains, if the moral law is taken out of the heart of man, that has inner restraints, that keeps us from stealing because we know it's wrong to steal, and no longer do we feel like it's wrong to steal, it's my privilege to steal it's my right to steal because you've got what belongs to me and I going to take it when we get to that point the only thing that's going to restrain lawlessness is law and order and yet sometimes even law and order has gotten unrestrained so we see it happening throughout the fabric of our society we've seen it happen in churches we see it happen in families. Oh, it can happen in families where parents are not subject to the law of God in their own hearts and they're raising lawless children. We're seeing it happen in the streets. We're seeing it happen in our cities. We're seeing people just give up control of law and order. I want to tell you, there will be people that will rise up and take law and order into their own hands. And folks, we don't want to live in that kind of world. We don't want to live in that kind of world. I don't want my kids and grandkids growing up in that type of world. We need to pray for God's righteous standard to rise back up. We've got to get back to this book. We've got to let righteousness be what God says righteousness is. Not what your opinion is and what my opinion is. We've got to get back to God's standard of justice. What, how do you correct what's wrong? Not by my standard of what I think is deserved because, you know, my, I'm, I'm a, a morally corrupt person without Christ. Because I always want justice for you, but mercy for me. That's the fallen nature of man. And so if you don't have laws restricting that, we will exercise vengeance on others and cry out for mercy and how mistreated I am. Only God can sort this out. Only God can calm the storm that we've created in the human heart. Well, God wants to save America. I believe America is worth saving. But America can only be worth saving if America is willing to be saved. God has not spared nations before us, and He'll not spare America either. We've got to return back to God. 
but lawlessness. People are going to be offended in these last days. Anybody know of anybody offended lately? <laughs> Offense leads to unloving responses. Unloving responses lead to division and betrayal. Division and betrayal lead to bitterness and hostility. Bitterness and hostility lead to injustice. Injustice leads to hate. Hate will empower false prophets who will rise up and say, I got your side, man. And they'll speak for God when they are false prophets in the land. They will sanction sin and they will defend lawlessness. And they will become heroes to lawless people. The increase in lawlessness will cause the love of many to grow cold. Because love is of God. God is love. And when love has been offended, hearts have been hardened, suddenly love doesn't flow out like it used to. And we don't love one another. We don't show love to them because we're angry. We're hurt. And we've taken things into our own hands. We're living in that kind of world before Christ comes back. The love of many will grow cold. And this lawlessness that we see in our land is prophesied to take place in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 8. It's preparing the way for the lawless one. The lawless one, the man of sin, is Paul's title or designation for what John the Apostle calls the Antichrist. So whether we're talking about the lawless one or the Antichrist, it gives us two insights. One, the Antichrist will be lawless and the lawless one will be Antichrist. And so we see the preparation made for the coming of the lawless one. So the message today is don't let your heart grow cold. I want to give you a few principles I think that will help us because at this time we need some principles. We need some, some way to find boundaries in which to live out our life where we can maintain our love and also live out the standard. And so, first of all, if we're going to maintain our love in the midst of this chaos that's going around us, We've got to understand the value of human beings. The Bible tells us that man is made unlike the other animals. I know there, are, there is a, a view that came in the mid-1800s called evolution. Darwin's uh, uh, survival of the species, the evolutional doctrine that he came up with. And what that did is it says there, is, there needs no longer to be an explanation of the human existence with God involved. We just kind of evolved by chance out of just muck and mire. And somehow by chance, suddenly life appeared. And out of that life, a cell began to form other animals and creatures and eventually mankind. And what that did is it took away the image of God in the heart and life of man. We robbed man of being in the image of God. And as a result, we no longer look upon human beings as created in the image of God. They are expendable. And so when I look at you and when you look at me, do we see each other as precious and valuable creatures, creation, made in the image and likeness of God? You are God's image bearer. Now it is distorted, obviously, by sin. But just like your children who bear your image, regardless of the troubles they get into, you love them because they are your children. You love them because they have value and they are precious in your sight because they have come from your own DNA. They are made in your likeness and image. And as a result, we need to see one another as valuable in the sight of God. Secondly, we need to remember who the real enemy is. 
Our real enemy is not the ones out in the street. Our real enemy is not the one on the police force. The, our real enemy is not the one who's, who's occupying a political office. It's not your neighbor. It's not your husband. It's not the person down the street. The real enemy of us all from the very beginning, is the one who showed his ugly head in the Garden of Eden, and that is the serpent, the dragon, the devil. He is our enemy. You are not my enemy. The devil wants to tempt me into thinking that you're my enemy. And when he begins to make me believe that, I begin to lose. I begin to lose ground. I begin to lose my love walk. And by the way, one of the greatest crimes against the the image of God in human beings is abortion. When we, when we can kill the human baby in the womb, we deny that it is a human being created in the image and likeness of God. Psalm 139. God is the one fashioning us in our mother's womb. Before we were ever born, He knew us. God has a plan for every conceived child in the mother's womb now there are accidental parents i understand but there are no accidental human beings everyone has value in the eyes of god they are made in his image and in his hand they can become great children and servants of the almighty god the devil wants to steal their destiny and rob kill steal and destroy but Jesus has come, hallelujah, as the Redeemer. And so everyone that looks like they're just out there on the edge of, of sanity, we, under, we need to understand God has hope for them. There is an answer for them. There is a pathway of return for them through Jesus Christ. So remember who the real enemy, Ephesians six twelve says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Folks, when we begin to see evil in the hearts of men, we need to begin to pray for the source of that evil in the hearts of men. It is the enemy, the devil himself, who is blinded and hardened and inspired that evil. They are victims. They are victims, even though they may seem like the ones who are victimizing. They are victims. And thirdly, we need to obey God's command to love our neighbor. Did you know that's a command? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's not just talking about the person who's got an address right next to you. When they asked Jesus, who is our neighbor? Jesus gave them the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that was a racial parable, by the way, because the Jews had racial animosity toward the Samaritans and the Samaritans had racial animosity toward the, the Jews. The Samaritans did not, uh, did not co commingle with the Jews. And the Jews, when they traveled up to Galilee, Samaria was in the middle of Judah, Judea, and Galilee was above and Samaria was right in the middle. They would travel around Samaria across the Jordan River, come back across the Jordan River to get up to the Sea of Galilee. Why? Because they hated the Samaritans. And Jesus gave a parable of the Good Samaritan. While the priest passed the man in the ditch, and while the Levite passed the man in the ditch, it was the Samaritan who came along and helped the man in the ditch, who was a Jewish man. And Jesus asked them, who was the neighbor to that man in the ditch? And they said, the man who helped. He said, that's your neighbor. When we go along life's way, we need to see people as our neighbor. If a person is in dire straits and God's put us in their path, we need to ask the Lord, God, how do you want me to help? How do you want me to help one of your sons, one of your daughters? It may be a divine appointment to share the gospel. It may just be a way of softening a heart. It may be a way of getting a, a vulnerable wife home to her husband. Or a daughter, a teenager, off the streets where they're vulnerable if they're broke down with a flat. Get them off the street before some 
opportunist guy comes along. You see, we never know who that person is. We need to love our neighbor. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 through 40, then one said, asking him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The love of God comes first. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So today, if we are going to experience the love that God wants us to have, it's two-tiered. First, it's the law, it's the love of God, and underneath that, hanging on the love of God, is the love of our neighbor. And every other commandment hangs on those two commandments. If you, remove, if you say you love God and you don't love your brother, you're a liar, the Bible says. But if you love your brother and you don't love God, what good is that? Because God is love. And so we need to love our neighbor. C.S. Lewis said the rule for all of us is perfectly simple. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the greatest secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him. If you do a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. Next, live it peaceably with all men where possible. Now, I understand there are some people who don't like us, don't like you, and will never like you. It may be the color of your skin, it may be your religion, it may be your relationship with somebody else. Whatever it is, there's no way they're going to like you, and there's no way to live in peace with them. But Romans chapter 12 Verse 18 says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. In other words, get the chip off your shoulder. And start looking for ways to live peaceably with others around you. Take some food to your neighbor that you don't know much about. Do something that shows that you are there for them and not against them. People need to know you're for them. When you walk in a new room and you don't know anybody, you assume right off the bat sometimes that there are people that are not going to like you because you just walked into the room. They prejudged you a certain way. And we do that. We prejudge people. And one of the best things we can do is begin to dismantle that false belief and go up and greet people and say, we, we're glad you're here. What's your name? My name is so-and-so. And we begin to find ways to be peaceable in the midst of this world. Next, we need to pursue peace in times of turmoil because turmoil will come. It's on us now. Things are in chaos. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue, pe pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. There's sometimes peace is not there. Maybe offense is there. Maybe racism is there. Maybe injustice is there. Maybe... We did something we didn't even know about. And then, so peace has been removed. But in that case, not just living in peace, but pursuing peace. Saying, hey man, I noticed that there, you, you tend to, to avoid me. Is there a problem here? I want to get it right if there is. Have I done something? Have I said something? And that means we've got to listen to one another. We've got to get down on their level. Because there are things, if you've been married, you know this. You can offend your husband or wife and not even know you did it. Right? You can offend them and not even know you did it. Because your perception of what you said and did is different from their perception of what you said and did. And so when you see them suddenly either get real quiet or suddenly they're snapping off at you, you're, you're assuming something is going on. And you've got to say, did I do something? And if they go, no, I'm fine. That is not a clue that they are fine. It means the actual opposite. And that is their way of saying, you better start digging for the real problem now. Amen? Oh, me. <laughs> so we are to pursue peace. Find ways to make peace. 
If you find someone that's hostile and angry and you don't share their view, say, man, I, look, I understand we don't agree on this. But I want you to know, I'm praying for you and I hope you're praying for me. We've got to live in this life together. And I'm for you, not against you. And I want to hear you out. I want to try to understand. Doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you. But I want you to know I'm going to try to understand and hear you out. And if possible, I'd like for you to hear me out too. Now let's see if we can get this straight. All right? Next, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Now is not the time to be a coward. Now is not the time to hide in the shadows. We must speak the truth. Ephesians 4.15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ. Now primarily he's talking to the church. Talking about brothers and sisters, but it, it can apply to every relationship. Speaking the truth in love. Now those two things go together. Speaking the truth and speaking the truth in love. Amen? Max Lucado said, the single most difficult pursuit is truth and love. That's the task of a Christian. Love and truth. Truth and love. No one at the expense of the other. Never at one at the expense of the other. Never the embrace of love without the torch of truth. Never the heat of truth without the warmth of love. Truth and love. Love and truth. Never one without the other. You ever been in a place where people just, as it has said, beat people over the head with the Bible? I mean, they just go into the conversation trying to win the argument even if they kill the person they're talking to. Ravi Zacharias, God bless him, he's gone on to be with the Lord. I, I really appreciated his ministry and apologetics. He said, if truth is not undergirded by love, it makes the possessor of that truth obnoxious and the truth repulsive. Isn't that true? That if a person comes to you and says, hey brother, I want to share something I believe you need to hear. It's a truth, whether it's about yourself or about God or about the Word of God. But if they come at you with, a, with an attitude of obnoxiousness about it, pride, ego, and all the rest, you can't hear the truth through all the smoke of, of obnoxious smell that's coming through. And so you automatically say, I ain't listening to anything you've got to say. Because of the way you're saying it to me. I completely feel your disrespect. I completely feel your arrogance. And you know, when a person with arrogance walks in the room, everybody knows it except the person who's got it. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So don't speak truth simply to win an argument. Seek to win the person. Isn't that the goal anyway? Win the person. Because if you win the person, they become an ally in the truth. Right? Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech, that means the way you talk, always be with grace. Seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. So he says, look, make sure that you're practicing how you're going to approach people before that day comes. Let your speech always be with grace, which is more than just mercy, but believing the best about people. Not coming at them as if they are going to be hostile, but coming with understanding and coming with love. You say, Pastor Keith, you do that? Man, I have to work at it. I'm kind of like Lot sometimes who is vexed in Sodom with all the things he sees around him. That's what it says in the epistle of Peter. He said that righteous Lot was vexed. His spirit was vexed by the things that he saw going on around him. And I see things happening around us and, and my spirit is vexed. It's grieved, but it ought to be grieved unto a crying out to God in prayer and a seeking to seek and save the lost. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That means make the Lord your God. Make sure He is the Lord of your life. Because I can guarantee if He's not sitting on the throne, everything else that comes off that throne is you. It's the flesh. It's your carnality. 
you're not going to be walking in the Spirit. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Meekness is not weakness, by the way. Meekness means complete submission under the control of God. It has to do with self-control. When they may say something that, that triggers you, that's a word people are saying today. So-and-so is easily triggered. And no people know how to pull your, get you to pull the trigger. When your trigger is a light trigger, someone says something, you're easy to pull that, and, 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 and man, it makes a mess. Makes a mess. But we need to do it with meekness, which has to do with complete self-control under the mighty hand of God. When we say, God, I put a guard, put a guard on my lips that I not say anything I shouldn't say. Sometimes you need to pray it before you say it. Amen? Pray it before you say it. If someone does something wrong and you want to say something right back to them and cut them down, walk away. Walk away and pray about it. Get your heart right and then come back and you say, okay, man, uh, can we talk about what you just said a minute ago? Can we just talk about that? Because when you said that, man, it, it, there's just, this came all over me. But I want you to know, I want to believe the best about you. And I want us to get this right. This does not need to be an issue between us. It takes the love of Jesus to do that, doesn't it? Next, determine to forgive when offended, wronged, and persecuted. Because not everybody's going to get it right with you. Not everybody's going to try to get it right with you. Not everybody's going to even believe they did something wrong. So you're going to be offended. Jesus said in this world, you will be offended. Offended, offense will come. But Jesus said, but woe to those through whom it comes. We don't need to be those who sow offense. We need to be those who know how to put out the fire of offense. And so that is through forgiveness. Now forgiveness is not a feeling in case you're confused about it. Because some people said, I don't feel forgiveness in my heart. Forgiveness is a choice. It is a choice. And as we forgive those who have sinned against us, then we are able then to walk forward with the slate clean and begin to love them in spite of what they've done. Offenses come to us all. And offense is, as John Bevere has said, the bait of Satan. The bait of Satan. Just like cheese in a mouse trap. The bait is what lures the mouse to the trap but the trap is what the enemy has set to get us snared. And so what the enemy wants to do is bring us under his power. He wants to snare us in unforgiveness. So what does he do? He sends offense. And because we're offended, we choose to hold a grudge. We choose to be unforgiving, which the devil's got us in his trap. And the way out of that is to forgive. And to release. I tell people this. It, unforgiveness is kind of like having a cage in your heart with somebody in it. You know, and, and you just harbor and you just, you just hate that person. I mean, you just despise them and you're always thinking about them. By the way, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. And so you've got this person in your heart. You hate them. You don't like them. It may be a group of people. It may be a certain race. It may be a certain police department. It may be whatever it is. Whoever that person or group of people is, they're in your heart and you're holding them in, un in unforgiveness. And every once in a while you just kind of take out that cage. You open it up. You grab them and you pull them out and you just do like this. And you put them back in there. And you just walk around with this hatred and unforgiveness in your heart. You are the prisoner in that situation. What you need to do is come to a place you can take them out and say, God, I'm tired of holding unforgiveness and I'm tired of being held by unforgiveness. And so, Lord, I open the cage and I take them and I release them to you. I'm not saying that what they did was right. And I'm not saying what they did didn't hurt. But I'm saying, God, I forgive them just like you forgave me. And now, Lord, they're yours. Do what you need to do in their life to bring them to repentance. To get their heart right with you. And now, Lord, that I am free from unforgiveness. The pain may still be there. 
But now, Lord, I'm a candidate for you to pour in your oil and wine. And come in and heal my heart from that which happened. Now, the scar may always be there. And it will always remind you not only of what happened, but it will also remind you of how God healed you. Amen? And you can be a testimony to others of how God can deliver us from offense and unforgiveness. Luke 23, 34, then Jesus said on the cross, could you imagine being crucified? Could you imagine being crucified for only loving people? Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You know, when we sin, are we completely in our right mind? We're not. Because the reality is, if you felt the way you did before you sin, as you feel after you sin, you would have never done it. Right? Because now that you've done it, you're under conviction. So if you had felt that beforehand, you wouldn't have done it to begin with. And so in a moment of insanity, you did something that now you regret. And we've all done that. And so we all need to be on the same level of mercy with each other. I'm going to do things to hurt you that I didn't intend to hurt you, but I will. Things I said. Sometimes I hurt people just by the fact that I walked straight from the back of the room up to here and I never said hi. I saw him say hi to ten people, but he walked right past me. The devil does that. Amen. Amen. He'll bait the trap. See which one you'll go for. All right. He'll set them out all over the place. It only takes one. Ephesians 4.32 And be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. How? Even as God in Christ forgave you. That's the standard. He told his disciples, love one another even as I have loved you. Not love one another in your kind of love, but love one another even as I have loved you. That's the standard. God's love. Next, overcome evil with good. We are to overcome evil. We are not to just avoid it. We're not to just let it continue to grow. There's evil going through our land, and what we are to do is we are to be proactive against evil, and we are to be actively involved in bringing it down. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48, tell, Jesus tells us how, and it's by overcoming evil, not with evil, but overcoming evil with good. Now that's hard. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That seems unreasonable, Jesus. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Wait a minute. I'm a child of God. I'm supposed to be acting different than the people around me. For He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, isn't that what we usually do? Love those who love you. What reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So who am I to emulate? I am to emulate my Father in heaven. I am to show that I am a child of God. That I, am, I have Jesus living in my heart. Romans 12, verse 20 and 21. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now what is this phrase, heaping coals of fire on their heads? Oh yeah, I'm going to burn them up. The Eastern Bible Dictionary gave this definition under the entry on coal. It said, heaping coals of fire on the head symbolizes overcoming evil with good. The words of Paul, Romans 12, 20, are equivalent to saying, By charity and kindness thou shalt soften down his enmity, as surely as heaping coals on the fire fuses the metal in the crucible. 
In other words, doing good begins to melt the heart of anger. It's not easy to stay angry with somebody that keeps blessing you. Someone curses you out, say, hey man, you've had a hard day. Let me buy, here's $20, go get you some lunch today. Man, I just cussed you out. I know, you've had a hard day today. Something, something about what's going on really made you mad. And, and Here, go get you some lunch. Call, just have a good day. Next, leave final justice in the hands of God. Oh, let me give you a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Martin, Le, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He had to stand up against injustice in his day. But I think a lot of people have forgotten some of the things he stood for and some of the things he said. They're not following his ways. Listen to what he said. Through violence, you may murder a murderer, but you can't murder murder. Through violence, you may murder a liar, but you can't establish truth. Through violence, you may murder a hater, but you can't murder hate. Darkness can't put out darkness. Only light can do that. Good words to live by. Next, leave final justice in the hands of God. There are going to be things in this life that are going to be unjust all the way till the time we go to the grave. There are people being persecuted in other lands and killed because of them being Christians. And there's coming a time of persecution upon us as churches. Just because of our faith. Folks, it's already begun. Where it's okay to have mass gatherings out on the streets without any kind of protection, but if you meet in a church house, you can get arrested. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourself. In other words, don't take justice into your own hands. But rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, meaning God, I will repay, says the Lord. Do you want God to fight your battles for you? Then you've got to let Him. When you take up the battle for yourself, you've just removed it from God. 1 Peter 2, 19-23, For this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that you should follow His steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth, who when He was reviled, did not revile in return, when He, was, he suffered, did not threaten, but committed Himself to Him, meaning God, who judges righteously. Matthew 5.10 Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That means for doing what's right. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. 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 For my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You ever had a party because you're under persecution? For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets before you. Next, perfect God's love in your heart. Now, it's good to be a loving person, but do you love like God loves? God doesn't want us to just love like people love. He wants us to love like He loves. In fact, it's going to take God's love to love some of the people we're going to face. They will far exceed my ability to love them. There are some people who are totally unlovable. Raise your hand. We've all been there. We're all unlovable. Why would God love us? Enemies of God. It takes God's kind of love. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 8 is the standard. Love suffers long and is kind. They're talking about God's love. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up in pride, in other words. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails.
fails. Love never fails. God's love. Our love fails. But God's love never fails. Ask God to begin to cultivate the fruit of the spirit of love in your heart. That's the only way you're going to have it. And finally, stir up love rather than hate. Folks, if you're watching cable news all the time right now, if you're listening to what's going on, it's going to stir up hate and ill will toward other people. Evil men consider how to stir up one another with hostility and insurrection. They look for ways to get you stirred up. And folks, there's a lot of it going on today. There wouldn't be near as much trouble going on today if there wasn't so much stirring people up. This has been, people have made a mountain out of a, a molehill. And I'm not saying that there aren't some serious things going on. But there are some people who are taking little things in the scope of the whole nation that can be solved very easily and trying to make a nationwide cause out of it to bring about an agenda that God has nothing to do with. Christians, on the other hand, we must stir up one another, but not like they do, but with love and good works. I'll leave you with this scripture, Hebrews 10, verse 24 through 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. What is that day approaching? Well, that goes back to our text at the beginning. The day when Christ comes back. The end of the age. That day's coming. As our worship team comes today. How is your love life with God and with others? Has your heart grown cold? Has it grown indifferent? Do you need God in your life? Have you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Today you can know that love. And you can begin to have experience the love of God. And you can begin to have the love of God to share with others. If you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, every head bowed, every eye closed. And you would say today, Brother Keith, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm, I try to be a good person. I try to be a religious person. I thought I was pretty good, but I realize today that I'm lost in my sin. And I need Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I want to be saved today. If that's you, would you just lift your hand today? Anybody that needs to be saved in this room. Would you stand, please? Maybe you're in this room. Maybe you're listening in. But I'll, today, we're going to sing a verse or two of this song and then we're going to close out with prayer. But this, is a, this song is a prayer. Our world needs God. We're living in a dry and thirsty land spiritually. Let's pray that God will send the rain. Amen. I am dry and thirsty.